For successful CLI access, you need to edit the Neticon file to fit your needs. This is usually done in System Files, and then you select Neticon from this drop down menu. Neticonf is usually the place where you define policies, how you want to manage your network. And one of the first entries here, besides the community strings, is how you want to have CLI access happening on your network. We see those entries here specifying the user keyword, a tab, the username, the password, and if required, the enable password. Down here we notice there is the admin again, a semicolon and a number. This allows us to use different passwords for the same username as only this part is actually being sent to the device. If you want to add another user, you simply enter the keyword and since tabs don't really make it into this text box, you can click this button to add a tab. Entering a new username, add another tab, and entering the password for accessing my ESX host, for example. Once you're done, you can have a look at this. Here you specify the prompt from your devices if they're asking for a username. So this can be user, username of course, login, whatever, similar variations. Also notice this is necessary for Procurve switches. And if your prompt still is not matched, for example, if you're using radius, you might add it here to this regular expression. Just be careful when using banners that they don't match this string at all or Neddy will get a false positive and eventually fail logging in. The next step is the policy for using SSH. With the keyword use SSH you can add always if you really want to only use SSH, never if you only want to use Telnet, and you can combine always and known if you only want to use SSH with known host keys. Now if you are to use SSH with known hosts only, you can fetch the host keys by calling Neddy, skipping pretty much everything else, verbus output, K for key scan, and add an IP for example. You could also use an uppercase A and specify a SQL query to add a batch of devices at the same time. Now if you execute this, it goes through very fast, since it's skipping everything that takes time, even the enterprise part no interfaces. And here we can see the key scan succeeded getting the SSH key and adding it to the SSH known hosts file. Of course you should do this as the user who is used by CronTap later on for automatic discovery or it won't work. If you comment it out completely here with the semicolon there is no SSH policy at all and Neddy will try SSH then Telnet if SSH fails. Further down in NetiConf is a section called Get Forward. This allows you to retrieve forwarding tables on Cisco iOS devices via CLI. Predominantly we're using the dynamic forwarding tables, but if you're using .1x or port security, you had to use SEC. But with the latest changes in Neti, this is not necessary anymore. If you want to force Neti to only use SNMP, you may do so by adding SNMP rather than DIN here. There are several possibilities a bridge forwarding table is accessible via SNMP on a switch. The most basic one stores the MAC address as decimal in the actual OID and as value you get a interface index on the right side. Now this is how Procurve does it and you would set the bridge select box to normal in DevGen. Now if this index does not match the actual physical interface index, you need to walk a index table in addition, which will map 
the resulting index into the physical interface index. That would mean you would have to select normal IF indexed in DevGen. Cisco, in addition, decides to use VLAN indexing. This means you have to do this from every VLAN you want to reach bridge forwarding entries from. The actual indexing happens by adding a at symbol to the community, followed by the actual VLAN ID. In SNMP v3, there is an actual context option you can use, rather than modifying the community string. This can result in problems anyways, if you have a at symbol in the community string already. Now we do this for VLAN 2, need to do the same for the interface indexing and so forth. And as you can imagine, this causes a lot of polls and traffic during each discovery, especially if you have a lot of VLANs on that switch. Once you're done with everything, you can go ahead and write the configuration file and proceed to the next step. I brought up our little PoE switch, which you might remember from the last tutorial. Here we see a red bulb, port is 22. There is a key symbol, which allows you to reset the CLI access. And this means Nettie actually has been trying to access the switch before. It succeeded with SSH, but it could not find a proper login that works. Now, in order to retry this again, we can have a look at discovering it, but we will find that it does not log in because it couldn't find a working user. This is pretty much what you see here as the status now. If you want to reset this, we can retry CLI access by deleting the port. As you can see here and here, the port has been reset. The bulb is still red, but we can try to back up the configuration again. It will go through all the users you've defined in NetiConf and tries to find the correct one. But so far, you can see it matched the password prompt, sending the password, but login failed. And this keeps going on all the way down. So it was not able to log in at all. Let's go back to same thing as before, port 22. Key icon is there, but no username. I guess this needs further debugging to find out what's going wrong. Open three terminal sessions to the actual NETI host. In my case, it's n8dev, which is NetIO8. Let me log in. Now we can just have a go at this. This way we will discover the device, but only test it. Minus D here adds some additional output options. So while it's discovering, we get output log and input log. So let's just tail minus F on either one of them. Once here, once here. Now we have a go again. But nothing happened. So what's the problem? Well, once Nettie decided it cannot access the device, it won't try it again. So we need to reset and try again. So it tries sending various passwords from the NetiConf. And here you see that it's failing every time. Now here I intentionally set the password to Cisco with a zero at the end, which of course would not comply with whatever we have in the NetiConf. So let me fix that 
put in the proper password and retry again. This is as simple as going back to the device, reset the CLI again, hit that button again and see what happens. Right here we did send the password and we got an enable prompt send terminal length 0 to avoid the more prompts do a show run and here it is finally we got a configuration from the device going back to device status we'll see that we got some additional icons here we got a username now and the bulb turned green so this looks good here is the configuration in the NETI database there is also the possibility to create files from it which then can be accessed in system files or if you want directly from here. In addition we can examine the configuration in Device Doctor which will rearrange the configuration to show interfaces, spanning tree, SNMP, service and logging specific parts. We can also use device write to show the log, for example, and pull up the output here. Of course, the whole thing gets a bit more complicated if you do have enabling procedures to fulfill. Um, you can, however, have a look at lip CLI IOPTY with Perl doc. It should give you some hints on how to get past this in case you have problems. There is some explanation on the internal variable settings. We can have a look at that later but you should really know what you're doing if you're going to play with those. There is however some more tips and hints on different platforms and now the function connect is actually the one that tells you on which state NETI is in connecting via CLI. Now if we glance over those different steps there is actually some devices asking for a username when you enable it. In that case you will end up going through CLI step 5 and 6. If not then you skip ahead with CLI step 7. And you should see this in NETI's output to exactly follow what's going on. And this is especially helpful when you're doing the tail minus F thing to isolate any login problems. The other functions are explained below, but not that important right now. Now let's check out the library itself. Here is the whole Perl documentation part. And further down we will have the command definitions of those different devices. In here, the most common one, the same we're using just now, the iOS part, shows you the read-only prompt, enable prompt, the command to actually enable the device, the command to show the configuration, a additional timeout that will be added for displaying the configuration, here we define which string should be matched to detect the start of the configuration. There is a command to turn off paging and for this device in particular we can show the MAC address table via CLI as we've learned before. I pulled up a Comware router here. It's my MSR 2011. Clicking here will reveal the configuration with all the changes that occurred since I'm using this device. Here is another example of a Procurve switch. Those devices are a bit trickier because they're using some escape sequences in their CLI, but nevertheless we can back up the device. Another example of a Enteresis router. No port whatsoever found yet. We'll start the discovery. I will try to log in. It did find a working user. We got an enable prompt and it's showing the configuration. Going back to the device, click here for a reload, we get all the new icons. A username has been found and the configuration is in the database. 
Here is another use for CLI access to a device. This box here does not support retrieving ARP tables via SNMP. Discovering it shows that preparing for the CLI reveals that retrieving the ARP table is supported. It logs in using admin semicolon 3 with SSH sends the password, turns off paging, shows the ARP table and retrieves the entries via CLI. Of course you can still have Netty back up the configuration as well. Here it goes. Another interesting idea is to back up ESX hosts. Here you see my VMs now with the CLI access I could delete VMs via command line I can power them up and of course I can back up the whole ESX configuration now here is some more stuff that needs to go in there like the path for your VMX files I guess we will see some improvements in that department but right now it works for me and it's just to show you the potential that Netty CLI architecture provides. Hope this helps. Thanks for watching.